please be seated. When it first happened, the minutes felt like hours. The hours felt like days. And the horror of what happened, one detail after another, could hardly be processed, much less understood. Then days turned into weeks, and weeks turned into years. Memorials were built, wars were fought, victims' names were read, survivors tried to pick up the pieces over and over again. But no matter how much time has passed, we vow to hold these memories. We will never forget those who were taken from us. The world changes and shifts this way and that. But one thing stays constant. One thing is steady. God. God weeps with us. God mourns with us. God bottles up our tears and records them in his book. He is closer to you than your own breath and remains the cornerstone of life. <laughs> God is the solid ground holding us up as the world moves beneath us. It's as true today as it was on that day. Our God reigns. He reigns over principalities and powers. His dominion stretches beyond what our eyes can see. And when the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, our God reigns. We will always remember. Shortly after the hijacking of Flight 93, a number of passengers picked up their cell phones and made phone calls and found out what had happened in previous incidences and found out that their flight was soon headed towards the capital. One passenger on that flight was Todd Beamer, a devout Christian, a Sunday school teacher, who would picked up the phone and called and got a hold of a air tower operator named Lisa, and they had a 13-minute conversation. They had soon decided, a number of passengers on that plane, that they would overtake Flight 93, that they would charge the cockpit. Ultimately, they would be successful as they would be heroes as the plane would not wind up at the U.S. Capitol or the White House, but rather in a field in Pennsylvania. On that phone call, Todd to Lisa, Todd had just gone through the Lord's Prayer in his own private prayer time, feeling the weight and the power of it. He asked Lisa to recite the Lord's Prayer with him. Think about that. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Getting off the phone, he said the infamous line, let's roll. And they stormed the cockpit. Everyone remembers where they were 20 years ago to yesterday. As a nation, we clearly saw evil on that day and we found the resolve to stand up and fight as a country. As we turn in our Bible to Ephesians chapter 6, the scripture will remind us that we are in a battle, a spiritual battle that at times surfaces with obvious evils that flood our evening news, but most of the time goes unnoticed beneath the surface leaving us to write prescriptions to deal with symptoms, half the time unaware that we are in the middle of a battle. I want you to make it a point this fall to tune in, to pay attention as we walk through this climactic final section in the book of Ephesians 
and we put on piece by piece the armor of God. Ephesians 6, 10 through 13, listen as I read this morning. Paul writes, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day, having done everything to stand firm. Will you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we come to your word this morning, needing and longing to hear a word from you. Father, we confess that we need to be taught through your Holy Spirit to be able to see reality as it is. Far beyond what we are able to see with our eyes and to hear with our ears. A spiritual reality that your scripture speaks of, that your son was so aware of, to the ability to do so much and to understand so far beyond what our feeble minds can. Father, teach us this day. Not so that we can shrug our responsibilities and and, and blame everything on an enemy that we can't see. And and not so that we can uh, run at an unsustained pace so that that we cannot legitimately uh, live life or enjoy life as you have given it to us. But Father, to, to understand the reality of who we are and and where we are. And as your word says, teach us to number our days. Father, we trust you because you have given your son for us. It is his cross that we can see with clarity in the midst of the storm, in the midst of the confusion, in the midst of of all the trials of life. We trust you, Father. We beg you to teach us, to grow us, to mature us, to prepare us for the battles that we face each day, to prepare us for the battles that are ahead, not just our battles individually, but but the the ones that our loved ones face, our our family, and, and that we face collectively as a church. Father, forgive us whenever we are not prepared because we have not pressed into you because because we have not allowed you to prepare us for those battles. We confess, we repent. Teach us now, we come to you with open hearts, longing to hear a word from you. We pray that in Jesus' name, amen. I first heard this true story uh, done by Mike Rowe on The Way I Heard It, a podcast. Iggy was once a highly esteemed medical doctor who would end up institutionalized and soon die, never knowing that he would actually change the world. You see, Iggy's hospital had two different maternity wards. One that was worked exclusively by trained doctors and the other one that was being used by medical students who were in training. 3% of the women who gave birth on the medical student side died soon thereafter. But on the doctor's side, the trained medical experts, their physicians, the death rate was 500% greater. Iggy was horrified by the disparity. And as you could imagine, the patients were too. 
Many of them, many of the expectant mothers had begged, just longing to move towards the student side. Uh, some of them had become so horrified by the doctor's side that they, they gave birth on the sidewalks rather than go in. Iggy searched for a number of possibilities. What could be behind it? Was it the overcrowding? Well, no, actually, the student side had more mothers on that side. Was it fear because, uh, because uh, uh, nurses and, and, uh, would ring a bell every time a, der- a death occurred? So they, they had them stop ring- ringing the bell and nothing changed. One after one, his hypothesis failed until one day he realized that only the doctors performed autopsies something the students didn't do. And many of the doctors would perform these autopsies right before helping mothers give births. What if they were carrying little bits of corpse on their hands? To test his theory, Iggy concocted a a special rinse of chlorine and lime to remove these little bits of corpse And wouldn't you know it, once tried, the doctor's side death rate plummeted to 3%, the same as the student's side. Well, Iggy quickly published his findings, only to be met with stiff resistance. You mean to tell me the cause is something that we can't see? And you're blaming experienced doctors this whole time for the horrors that have occurred? Absolutely not. Iggy was ridiculed, pushed out, and when he wouldn't back down, institutionalized. You see, it would be 20 years later that Louis Pasteur would call those little bits of corpse germs. And Iggy would die a scorned doctor because he was asking that we rethink Everything that we do based on something you can't see and wash your hands. As Paul concludes our letter to the Ephesians, he uses strong, alarming language. That, if true, requires you and I to change absolutely the way we view the entire world. You see, reality, according to the Bible, is that you and I are in the middle of a battle. Whether you like it or not, that spiritual warfare rages all around you because we are behind enemy lines. The Bible refers to this reality over and over and over again, that you have been rescued from the the kingdom of darkness and transferred into the kingdom of the beloved son, Colossians 1. Romans 5 says that you were the enemy of God fighting against him. First Peter says that you are strangers and alien in this land, that it is not your home, that we long for the return of King Jesus, who will one day make everything new and make everything right. And here earlier in Ephesians chapter one, Paul used the language of redeemed, which if if you remember when we walk through it, that language of redeemed is language of ransoming a POW to Purchase one from ransom. And now, as Paul builds to the ultimate climax of the entire book of Ephesians and and presses on us application for what it means for Christians to walk worthy of the Lord and the salvation that he has given to us, he says, you must put on armor because we're in a battle. It's not, hey, what if we thought of life like this? Or would you mind volunteering to enlist in this battle? No, it's I need to remind you that our battle is not against flesh and blood. 
that we are in the middle of spiritual warfare, whether you like it or not, that you are behind enemy lines, that this is the reality according to the Bible. So let's pause for a moment and let's ask the question, what happens when we don't have a wartime mentality? Because yes, the Bible has other images for life that we're supposed to be filled with joy, that our Father longs to give us good gifts that he wants his children to enjoy, that that life could be compared to abiding in the vine. But if we're honest, repeatedly the Bible goes back to the idea of warfare. So what is the cost if we do not have a wartime mentality? You see, in wartime, we expect trials. We anticipate attacks from the enemies. We are alert and we are prepared. And when trials come, we fight and we overcome. In peacetime, we're worried about comfort. Imagining how we can get all that we deserve out of life. We become very self-centered. You see, when you don't expect a battle, suddenly you are surprised by opposition. And it leads to confusion and great fear. I can't tell you the number of times as a pastor in consoling moments in the midst of absolute heartache, people say to me, where was God? What did I do to deserve this? You see, in peacetime, we assume so much about what's fair in life. We assume that we will outlive our children, that our spouses will have long, healthy lives. We assume that everything will go according to our plans, that we will be able to chase the American dream, uh, uh, live in a nice house with a white picket fence, have 3.2 children, that our, our career will go according to plan, that we will have a son who's a superstar athlete and a daughter who's the first woman president. But these assumptions ignore the reality of a cosmic battle that will remain until Jesus returns. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you, which comes upon you for your testing, as though something strange were happening to you. You see, furthermore, in wartime, we recognize the value of sacrificing for the side because we long to be a part of its purpose. James Bradley writes in Flags of Our Fathers about what it was like during World War II. Americans pitched in to support strict rationing programs, and their boys turned out as volunteers in various collection drives. People grew victory gardens and drove at the gas-saving victory speed of 35 miles per hour. Now think about that, driving at 35 miles an hour and doing it for the side. The phrase, use it up, wear it out, make do with it or do without, became a popular slogan. You see, in peacetime, we think about vacations and what new product we can add pumpkin to this fall. (laughs) Peacetime is about preferences. Wartime is about purpose. Pause for a second and consider the landscape of cultural Christianity. Let me say it again. Peacetime is about preferences and wartime is about purpose. See, the result is Jesus looks like a side interest, like a club that you join. Hey, I'm part of the book club at the library. Oh, I do yoga. Oh, yeah, well, I go to church. Hey, that sure was an entertaining sermon today. The music was much more my preference. 
You see, it may make us uncomfortable to speak with such urgency, but sticking our head in the sand won't remove the fact that you and I have an enemy. In fact, a whole host of enemies who are at war with you, whether you like it or not. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Paul is not aiming here to give you some sort of lofty uh, dichotomy so that you can diagram demonology. Rather, he is giving you terms about a spiritual realm and spiritual forces that are against us all the time. The Bible says that Satan is the accuser of our brethren, is a liar, and is a deceiver, who is as powerful and influential enough to pull away a third of the angels that we now call demons in an absolute rebellion against God. He hates God and he hates you. He hates your children. He hates your grandchildren. He hates your neighbor. And if we begin to ask the question, what is being battled over? The simple answer is you and your children and your loved ones. That all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That all will one day stand before God in the judgment seat and apart from Jesus Christ will spend eternity in a place called hell. And the only way the Bible knows how to describe what it's like to be separated from the eternal God is it's like being on fire all the time and it never goes out. Listen to me, hell will not be Satan's playground. He will not be overjoyed in that moment. It will be absolute misery for all who are separated from God. But as God's image bearer, God sent his son because he desires more than any other thing than to save you based on mercy. To, to apply the full wrath and judgment that your sin deserves upon his son so that you might be saved. And Satan and his demons do not want in any way for God to be glorified by his mercy. Listen, the reality is, is it's not a real battle. God at any moment could snap his fingers and the entire thing go away. But he is patient and he delays because he longs for his image bearers to freely return to him, to bow their knee in praise of him rather than bow their knee because they're forced to because of his wrath. That you and I are in the midst of a battle whether you like it or not. And here in the context of Ephesians 6, in this context, Paul writes that because Satan hates you, even though you have been saved, brothers and sisters, that he greatly desires to make you ineffective. Discouraged, distracted, and disqualified from the mission that God has you on and wants to use your life for. Look with me in verse 11. It says that Satan schemes against you. And in verse 12, that word struggle there is the same word. It's, it's an athletic term for wrestling. Hand-to-hand combat. What is being communicated here is that the attacks against you are personal and intelligent in nature. Listen, Satan's not going to knock at your door with, with horns and a pitchfork and say, hey, would you turn your family over to me? Rather, he's cunning. 
and he whispers in your ear. He knows all of your weaknesses and he attacks you with lies. She's never going to change and you can't lead her because she won't listen to you. This marriage isn't worth fighting for. Hey, remember growing up without? Well, you're somebody now. Look at all the stuff that you can buy. If you don't seize control right now, you will go right back to that dark day. <laughs> A few clicks on the computer won't hurt anyone. You never connected with your mom. You better give those kids everything that they want so that you can connect with them. Where was God? Where was God the night of that accident? He didn't stop it and he doesn't care. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day. Back in chapter 5, verse 16, Paul already told us that the days were evil. A general term re re uh, referring to the nature of man and the whole direction of the world. But here he refers to the evil day. Singular. Meaning the day of attack. In other words, patient, uh, Satan is patient and shrewd. Waiting. He doesn't come and apply constant force all the time. Rather, he bides his time for precise moments that he may pounce when your guard is down, when you're hurt the most. The evil day. A young teenage girl was angry and confused. And in some of the darkest moments, she contemplated suicide. In fact, she had grabbed her father's handgun and hid it underneath her mattress. One day, she had some friends over, and she pulled it out to show them and began to open up about some of those dark moments. In an unimaginable moment, thinking that the gun wasn't loaded. She put it to a young man's head and pulled the trigger. The gun was loaded and the young man lost his life. And his friends and his family forever shaken. I can't think about that moment without thinking about the schemes of the enemy and the shockwaves and horror that have resonated in friends and family ever since. And I know you have your stories. And they may sound different, but they are equally vile in nature as Satan attacks on that evil day. He hates you and your children and your neighbor and your boss. And there are moments when, when if you and I genuinely stop and we begin to contemplate his ability and his power and his, his, his reaches and the way that his tentacles go into every single one of us, it can become absolutely overwhelming to think about how much smarter and bigger and stronger our enemy is. But listen to me, beloved, do not despair. Do not despair. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God, God's armor, so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God 
so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Listen to me. It is God's strength and God's armor that he who ventured behind enemy lines to rescue you and to redeem you when you were dead, when you were not looking after him, when rather you were an enemy, he who took out that heart of stone and inserted a heart of flesh that beats for him and now you have passions and you want to gather together and hear his word and hear me get all stirred up and read the Bible to you. He who did that It is his armor. It is his strength. He who ransomed you as a prisoner of war. Who transferred you from the kingdom of darkness. And has now transferred you into the kingdom of his beloved son. You see, even the first command in verse 10. That says be strong is in the passive tense. It means be made strong. Because you and I are to simply lay hold of the divine resources made available to us. Catch this. The armor of God is the climax of the entire letter to Ephesians. Everything that we've been walking to since January is now being cultivated here. That he began in chapter 4 talking about walk worthy and to Put off and put on the new self. And now he ultimately describes that as putting on the armor of God. And think back all the way to Ephesians chapter 1. How Paul started those first three chapters with this high, lofty, exalted view. That you and I in Christ Jesus have every spiritual blessing. Every spiritual blessing is ours in Christ. And we as the church are the living temple, the people of God indwelt with the Holy Spirit. And we have the gospel that will go to the ends of the earth. All of those promises, all of that mission, listen to me, is based off the end of chapter 1 where Christ who was dead, is resurrected and ascended and is now seated at the right hand of God the Father. And in 121, it says, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church. You see, that's the king that is offering you his armor. It's his strength. It's never in your own strength. It's never for you to puff out your chest. It's only for you to take and to grab a hold to put on that which is already yours. Do not be discouraged, beloved. Because the enemy is bigger and stronger than you ever imagined, more powerful than you. Do not be overwhelmed because there are eternal consequences to this war. Rather, remember that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords is on your side. You weren't even aware of all of this when you were dead. You're just dead in your sins, sinking in the mire, having no clue of what was going on around you. And now he has rescued you. He has redeemed you, has opened your eyes. Do not be discouraged. He is the king of kings and he is the Lord of lords. I only have a short bit of time to to unpack. All I can do is give you an overview. But what you need to understand, and this is a study lesson for you this week. You need to understand that Paul, with the armor of God, is borrowing from Isaiah chapter 11 and chapter 59. You go and study that this week. I'm going to describe to you real briefly what happens in Isaiah 59. There is a problem that's introduced And God, who is sitting in heaven, looks down. And he is separated from man, his image bearers, because of their sin. 
And from God's seat, as he looks down, he sees the wickedness of the whole earth and how man constantly runs to evil. And even the repentant ones are still caught in the mire of their sin. You see, there is no justice. All man does is run to evil, commit evil acts man to man. There is no light, only darkness. Men and women grope along like blind guides, just just feeling their way forward. They long for hope, but there is none. And in Isaiah 59, it says that God searches, that he looks to and fro throughout the earth for someone to help, someone who can bring hope, someone who can intercede on their behalf, but he finds none. And so God says, I will rend the heavens. I will come down. I will bring salvation. I will do what can't be done. In Isaiah 59, verse 17, it says, he put on righteousness like a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and he wrapped himself with zeal as a mantle. God said, I will do it myself. I will come down. I will be the savior. I will defeat Satan. I will bring righteousness that cannot be found anywhere. I will bring justice. I will judge those, uh, the wicked. I will do it all. I will be the savior of all. I will, I will, I will. And he sent his son. That's the armor of God. Picked up from Isaiah chapter 59, given to us. He will, he will, he will, and he sent his son. S.M. Lockridge was the pastor of Calvary Baptist Church, a prominent African-American congregation in San Diego, California, from 1953 all the way till 1993. I want you to listen and watch this short video. It's from a sermon clip where he says it better than anyone has ever said it, titled, That's My King. The Bible says my king is the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I wonder do you know him? My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduring strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent. And he purifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's the key to knowledge. He's a well of wisdom. He's a doorway of deliverance. He's a pathway of peace. He's a roadway of righteousness. He's a highway of holiness. He's a gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign and a yoke is easy and his burden is light. I wish I could describe him, but yet he's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. 
Jesus. We come before you as a congregation. We bow our hearts and our knees and we kneel before you. You are our king. You are so good to us. You never stop working and moving in our hearts and in our lives. We rejoice in praising you. We long to see you as you are. King Jesus, we want to walk worthy of you. We want to accomplish all that you've set out for us. We do not want to be distracted, disqualified, discouraged. Lift our heads, please, through the power of your Holy Spirit. Teach us this fall what it means for us to put on your armor. Help us to see. Father, we cannot see. We are but dust. Help us to see reality as you say that it is. Because we want to walk worthy of you. We want to stand before you and hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. We want to be able to have crowns that we cast at your feet for the glory of your name. King Jesus, help us. Help us to think rightly and help us to put on your armor. Forgive us when we run into battle in our own strength, when we are deceived, or most of the time disinterested. Help us to walk worthy of you. King Jesus, it's in your name we pray.